Uh, there's um, those that had good accommodations said that took about a median of 27 days to recover, versus those that had poor accommodations were cleared within 19 days. So that was actually the exact opposite of kind of what we were hoping to show. Uh, but it's not a significant difference. For them, we looked at those that had their concussion and were recovering while school was in session. So they're in that more cognitively demanding environment. And it took them a median of 25 days to recover, whereas those that were concussed and recovering during school had a um, median of 17 days to recover, uh, which again is not significant, but certainly something we're kind of keeping our eye on. And those that had post-concussive syndrome, of the 13 that have been enrolled since January, only three of them have actually gotten medical clearance, the other 10 are still in the study. So they're really suffering is pretty much the take home message there. So then we did a survival analysis kind of graphing what's going on with time to recovery, which is the bottom access. The blue group is saying, you know, we didn't really have very good accommodations, and the red group is saying, um, that they did have good school related accommodations. We can see that they're taking longer to recover and our hazards ratio that's looking at to see if whether that blue line is any different than the red line, um, the confidence that it falls past one, so no it's not significantly different, but on the other hand it's kind of the exact opposite of the graph that we're hoping to show. Well we ask kids like what classes are you really struggling with now that you're back in school? Math was the most common one, followed by science and phys ed. We asked kids, like, how do you think school really affected your quality of life? 30% uh, roughly said a lot, about 40% said a little, and 30% said no, really had no effect. The amount of school that they're missing between full, full and partial days, so maybe they went to school and were like, no, I can't be here, and left for whatever reason. Uh, they're li missing about median of seven days, so a week and a half of school because of the concussion. So then when we did the focus group um, stuff, this was, we did them with, uh, these are the parents that had acute concussion kids and we asked about their school. So uh, one parent said when he got his report card and went through and his gym work was extremely low, he didn't know he's got a concussion, you know he can't be in gym class, he couldn't even be in the gym. Another parent said, teachers understanding of what a concussion is and just the whole idea that they don't look sick doesn't mean that that's not actually affecting them. So that's why it's kind of called the invisible in or injury. You wouldn't expect that same kid with a broken femur to participate in his ed class, but just because it's a concussion, you look fine, we do expect you to. Another parent said, well, we didn't have a choice. It was right in the middle of exams, so it's either you write or you don't write and you don't finish your courses. So that kid got his concussion right before final exams and the school's attitude was like, just write your exams, you'll be fine, and then we'll deal with your concussion afterwards, which, again, is kind of the exact opposite of um, cognitive rest. Uh, another parent said, well, he did drop one of his classes. It was pre-calculus, which was, was very strong in, and he just couldn't do it. When we asked these parents about how they thought quality of life was affecting their kids, they said, uh, what I've noticed between then and now are the anger issues with him. You know, he's never had that anger, which he didn't have before. Another kid just sort of summarized it up with his mom has just taken so much. Uh, another kid's a, a parent said, it's a bit boring, lonely at home, so he'd go try to go back to school, and then that just wouldn't work. So it wasn't, I thought there'd be way more kids being like, I don't want to go to school, this is my out. But conversely, they're not really allowed to be packed to playing sports until they've been cleared to go to school. So kids are motivated for the most part to actually get cleared and not sort of fake their symptoms. Another parent said, it was such a long period where you'd just be laying in bed isolated. Like it's just he didn't have his normal personality. He was very withdrawn. When we asked the students, uh, some of them had to say, the teacher doesn't completely understand that I can't really do anything when you're concussed. She was talking to me about how I had emailed to my friends and gotten the homework through them, but I missed it to complete. Um, I was trying to explain to her that, you know, I'm not supposed to use a computer, I'm not really supposed to be doing anything. Another kid said, I know a lot of times I would just zone out, I would just be, I would just not be able to concentrate, or I'd be telling myself to concentrate so much that I was only concentrating on concentrating. Another kid said, they don't make exceptions, but they kind of care, so I'm not really sure how that care was manifested <laughs> for that one, but good that he felt better about it. 
Uh, we talked to the parents with post-concussive syndrome, and one parent said he had missed five weeks of school or more continuously, and so then when we did go to school, he couldn't really function and he would have migraines. So I went to go to school, I pick him up, take him home and try again the next day. Got to the point where he wanted to commit suicide and wanted to kill himself. It was too much pressure at the school wanting him to do so much, but he can only do so much. <coughs> Another parent said they hinted that his kid might be getting kicked out of school if he doesn't reach our criteria of what we expect our students to be. He may no longer be here next year. Doesn't matter what kind of situation he's in, that's our policy. A third parent said the teacher told her, you're going to fail gym. I mean, this was a kid who was on the ice six days a week and you're gonna fail her in gym class. Um, in terms of what the parents said about their kids' quality of life with post-concussive syndrome, uh, one parent really highlighted that it was the isolation. You're not going with a group of friends every single night that are going to practice and games and everything. And even when you get the okay to sit on the sidelines while you're still just sitting on the sidelines. Uh, another person or parent said her daughter had a concussion in October and she was <coughs> for the rest of the school year. And then it was her grade year, grade 12 year, so she had to go back to school the next year. She's smart, she's on the honors roll, and yet she has to go back. All, her parent, all of her friends are going on, so it just makes her really tough. So it's kind of a management idea of isolation. Another parent talked about, I think it's the anxiety. She never had anxiety. I couldn't leave her side. She was terrified at school. I'm not going to call it depression, because it was never diagnosed, but she was very down. And another parent said, um, because your eyes, you know a lot of things, uh, or so you tell a lot of things, and to me it's like, you know, wow, there's something so wrong emotionally with him, not just physically. When we talked to the students, some of the things they said were, they were good, referring to the teachers, but then I started to miss school more and more, and they gave me more homework. So, yeah, the opposite of what we're hoping for. Uh, yeah, most teachers were good, except it got to a long period of time they started disbelieving me about it. And another kid said that they weren't willing to offer me extra help, so they just failed me. So in our conclusions, uh, we found that a lot of these kids have already had a concussion. A biggest risk factor for having a concussion is already having a sustained one. And the, each concussion you get, as they build, they take longer and longer to recover. So it really highlights that we need to prevent those initial concussions in the first place. On average, they're missing about, taking about three, three and a half weeks to recover. Um, with greater sample size, you ought to be able to show that those that recover in the summer recover quicker than those that are concussed during the school year when they are in an environment of less cognitive exertion. Summer holidays aren't nearly as hard as going to school. So all our domains of quality of life improved with each subsequent visit, uh, but the baseline and cognitive functions uh, quality of life were the poorest. Cognitive functioning remains pretty low even after they've received medical clearance. Cognitive functioning really got at their ability to pay attention. Could you remember things? Could you think about things? And those are all kind of skills that really are helpful in school. So accommodations didn't actually improve recovery time. Um, why, some reasons we thought maybe this might be, is that students not recovering um, are more likely to get better accommodations, so they're just not getting better, they're suffering. Maybe their parents are helping them navigate the school system and they're really um, kind of forcing the school to accommodate them better, perhaps. <coughs> or that those kids that are recovering quickly and typically just aren't searching out accommodations because they don't require them. And maybe students are less worried about actually staying home and recovering um, if they feel like their school is going to be accommodating to them when they get back. So that might explain why we didn't show what we thought we were going to. On the upside, about 70% of kids were satisfied with their school accommodations, but I think our focus group data really highlights that there's still more to be done in this area. Another thing that kind of came out of the focus groups is these parents are really having to advocate for their child. Um, you know, they didn't really know a lot about concussion, then all of a sudden their kid has one. They have to learn it all really quickly so then they can go back to the school and kind of help their kid navigate or explain why they're not going to be in school. Um, and some of these schools seem to have really rigid school environments, like the phys ed policy seems 
semi ridiculous, particularly when the phys ed teacher, anyone was going to know about concussions. That's probably the teacher that would know the most in theory. So I think there's a role for the concussion clinic to kind of help parents and students with the school system. And also, another idea we're kind of exploring is this parental support group. Uh, when we did the focus groups and kind of wrapped everything up, I was like, I'm going to be sleeping here tonight because they're all just hanging out and talking to each other. And like, oh, did you know about this tutor for that class? And I did this and I did that. And repeatedly they had said, like, it was a really cathartic experience for them to be around other parents because they just sort of assumed that they were the only one and their kid was the only one that was suffering like this. Um, so it was also really validating for, I've never done really qualitative research, so it's good to see like, okay, this is why we're doing this. You know, some of these kids are um, having struggles and there's certainly ways that we can improve this. So perhaps a support group for the parents might be in order. In terms of our limitations, we have a few analytical issues. So as I first mentioned, quality of life and PSQL also does measure school functioning, uh, but we, kind of messed this up a little bit, which is why this is a pilot study. So the quality of life part of school asks about when you're attending school, how do you rank a variety of things? But some of those kids weren't attending school, but we don't know for their first visit if they've been going to school first or not. So are they completing that as if I was going to school? This is how it would feel? Or were they scoring all zeros because they weren't in class? That was just kind of something that, in hindsight, we could have done a little bit better. So we have to figure out how to make sense of some of that data. Uh, not being able to play your sport is what tanks your quality of life, and it's not necessarily the concussion per se, but just the isolation and not participating. So we're going to start a quality or case control study, uh, hopefully kind of October, November-ish, and that will be recruiting from the Pan Am Minor Fracture Clinic. We're going to do a couple more focus groups with parents and students, and then also with some teachers and administrators from schools, because we can say, well, these are the 900 things that would be super great for you to do, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's feasible in the school system. So we're going to have to figure out how to tap dance that line of helping the kids, but not making it overwhelming or overbearing for the teachers. Hopefully, uh, kind of collate all this evidence and design an actual return to learn program for kids for the province much in a similar way that there is the return to play for sports and let's kind of catch up with the cognitive exertion as to where we are in the physical exertion part of concussion management. Uh, there definitely seems to be for some teachers a lack of knowledge about concussions so we'd like to do some education with them so whether that's going to their professional development days or doing in services with the teachers, but somehow trying to get them to realize um, some of the struggles that these kids are having. So just thank you to uh, co-investigators Mike Ellis and Leslie Ritchie, and then three research assistants who have spent lots of time at the concussion clinic and probably know those kids better than some of their own siblings at this point. <laughs> and tracking down report cards and whatnot. And it was funded from the University Grant, Grant Research Program, and the next one will be funded through an interest. So that's what we've done over the last few months. Well, when we should talk really fast and be done well on time. <laughs> we should talk at a rate I can understand. It's <laughs> 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 so, for you, uh, Waving at Kelly. Yeah, <laughs> I know, it was really interesting. Um, my question is probably both to you and Mike Bova. The use of medical clearance as that time point, and I was wondering what goes into your, like is there a really structured way to decide, yes, you're medically cleared for school? Yeah. And I'll follow up with my question. Yeah, so there's, um, there's not really great guidelines for doing that. Um, in general, we try to help that our guidelines that I use currently are as a patient allows to participate in school without any symptoms or issues. But they have built to navigate that graduate return play guidelines. And do they not have something else that we've um, looked at in the future uh, manuscript, which we looked at as a vestibular ocular dysfunction or high movement uh, issues? Um, so those are the three criteria that we use. Um, there's neurocognitive outcomes that you can use, but we didn't at the time have uh, neuropsychologists on, which we now have, so we can use that as well. 
that's probably the most comprehensive that most people would use. And, and most clinics did get an initial contact and they said, you know, can we off and we go through this uh, program with your home. So that's the clinical endpoint that we use to say someone's recovered, obviously acknowledging that we don't have a diagnostic test. Mm -hmm. And so then my follow-up to that is, is it possible that the lack of accommodation a student then has a certain amount of stress and says, I've got to get back to school because they're not accommodating with me. The way I'll get back to school is by telling me I'm not having symptoms. Is that possible? Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, we, we know that because we don't have an objective test, that we, and we know that in the discussions, you know, most of the time it's motivated to get back to play hockey. So yes, had, absolutely. In, our, in the focus groups, we had kids that right said, like, I completed live of this. Mm -hmm. And we've had uh, these two that were in the studies, you know, um, go back and then have protracted symptoms afterwards because they kind of decide to play all the playoffs with symptoms. So um, hopefully the neuroscience stuff will help that because it's cheap mm -hmm. and easy to administer, but yeah, that's the limitations of this population. Yeah, our poster child that they're going to use for everything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 After playoff hockey was like, yes, I need another appointment. <laughs> He doesn't know what he's putting at risk. Yeah. No, because I mean, it's a teenager. They're 14, 15 years old and short sighted. So, you look like your, your largest pool is a soccer player, right? Yes. How did they develop From the ball trauma? Or, or a lot of it is like them going up them. to edit ball together. Mm -hmm. and I would have anticipated that being less. Yeah, no, it's a lot of head to head. And when you think about soccer in general, it's really not concussion management friendly, right? Like you have, in the World Cup, they the finals, and so my guy was stumbling around for 15 minutes. He's like, what game are we playing? And then they pulled him off. When you have limited substitutions, people don't want to leave, right? And be like, oh, okay, you're fine, and come back on. So once you're out in soccer, you're out. You can't come back the same game. So I think soccer rule changes definitely highlight some ways that we can prevent concussions. And, and then my other question then, I guess, goes along with the, the good accommodation, which is for accommodation of schools. Were there, were there any particular schools that were any better than others? Did you see that? Well, any teachers? Where are you your kids well, <laughs> <laughs> the point I'm, I'm making is that were there teachers there that were just better at recognizing that maybe that's why they provided a longer accommodation and a good accommodation, and that's why as opposed to others that didn't have the same quality of or, or, or skill in terms of recognizing the error or managing in that sense. There was some variability within schools for sure. Um, I would have a a lot of expect, I would have expected to play on Me too. Um, there was, I think, more of a fear of falling behind within the private school system. Um, a couple of people said, um, this wasn't their first rodeo. They had another kid go through, and that first kid kind of was a sacrificial lamb in terms of figuring out how, how the school responds to it. Uh, but that and another one was like, but just because I have a concussion doesn't mean that you're going to heal the same way. So they're like, well, they just kept comparing me to so-and-so because they recovered along this trajectory, and that's not the one I'm following. Um, in terms of what accommodations did you most value? I think it was before the kids actually said my teacher was slowing me down and like recognized that I started to suffer and like, okay, you we're done, rest for the rest of this class or whatever. So there does seem to be some variability, certainly, whether that's at a school level or a teacher level, I'm not sure. And was the difference between the project? Um, the private kids, as I said, are the same in terms of accommodations, um, I didn't notice my kind of really dug super deep. Yeah, do you have to the rest? Is that just saying you can participate in a review? Or is it also like practices such as meditation or those kind of things? Um, I think you could meditate. It's a lot of dark room, sitting around, sleeping. It's 
Would you don't give them specific practices no. or, or instructions? No, just avoid all the things that you want to be doing, essentially, when you're stuck at home alone. Most of the kids, when they get to teenager children, will get um, recommendations to basically do nothing until we see them, which in a lot of ways is beneficial because we normally can kind of remove those restraints once, once we see them. And people have tried to create um, standardized uh, uh, cognitive rest accommodations, but it depends largely on the kids' symptoms. So everybody's different. So some kids can play, you know, uh, PlayStation for nine hours a day with no problems, but they've got problems breathing. And so the, we generally kind of try to tell them what we're looking at. <laughs> acknowledging, <laughs> acknowledging, you don't have no ups. Not under reporting, obviously. So it, it kind of is different. I mean, it's a challenge for us trying to navigate some of the literature that's out there. Because most of it's very generic. And then we try to create like a return to learn step by step process that mirrors the um, uh, return to play steps, but they're virtually useless. And they're not based on any empirical data. This is Kelly's work is probably the only empirical study that's actually ever looked at this. And, Real patients, as opposed to just getting educators together and drafting a massive long uh, uh, document publishing it in pediatrics, which is essentially all these other um, After you design the program, what are your plans to study it after that? Is there any way to randomize that, or would you have to? Um, I think we could do like a cluster RCT and randomize schools, would be our ultimate plan. But I guess it also somewhat depends a bit on. Board of Education, and I mean, there's like a zillion school boards in Winnipeg, which I also find very bizarre. So I guess if some board oh, to pick it up, I think there's like six school boards in the city. That's probably not big enough for a whole cluster of your area of divisions. No, but if some divisions didn't do pick it up and yeah. some did, then you then probably you that. So a bit of it kind of depends on. I mean, we certainly want to evaluate some way or another, and I think a cluster RCT would be our pipe dream situation, but it's going to depend on what the school was too. I was wondering if you saw any age-related differences like between the 13-year-olds, let's say, and the 18-year-olds in terms of their outcomes and also in terms of how they perceive their school's accommodatingness. Like, as a teacher, I might be more accommodating to a grade 7 student compared to a grade 12 student. Maybe I would be more patient than Oh, well. yeah. I'm yeah. Looks better. I think of little kids more gently. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see anything like that? I honestly haven't looked because we've got I think, like only 40 kids have cleared so far. We're hoping to get close to 80, so we haven't done a lot of subgroup analyses yet, but it's definitely something we keep in mind. Yeah, totally. It's younger kids get better accommodations because I essentially tell anybody that's less than grade 11 that your marks really don't matter. Um, and so, you know, if you're, you know, take a week off, it shouldn't be a big deal. And, and I often, obviously have to write strongly worded notes to the schools, you know, informing them that concussions and brain injury. And that, you know, there shouldn't be that level of expectation. But once it gets under the grade 11 and 12, the, the course is kind of, it's kind of a free-for-all in a lot of ways. And, so, you know, I, to answer the question about private schools, it, you know, we didn't look at the actual schools themselves. We kind of wish we did in retrospect. I'm sure. I don't know if anyone sits on board of directors in private schools here, so I'll try to not mention it. But um, <laughs> probably a chance that there is. So. <laughs> but I, like in some ways, it's almost like I almost feel like it's an independent risk factor for taking longer because there's definitely private schools um, that uh, that really slave drive their kids. And, you know, are really having it probably worked out for the best in the end, but. Um, you know, definitely don't recognize that uh, you know taking nine courses when you're in grade you know ten is abnormal compared to you know public school populations. And we will have that because we have the report cards. Yes, they have schools on them, yeah, so we can go back and yeah. it's always on grade twelve. Tell me where it has to be. It's a private consultation. Is there a standard way of sort of scoring the severity of the condition? And how and would you see a cluster? Do you look at in your place or do you see severe? These are going to be a bit more severe than the average population just because you have to get referred there. So they'd either go through a merge or a GP. They can't just like show up at the clinic and be like, I'm here. 
So we have to have a little bit more severe, but in terms of a really good rating system, we don't have that. So much of it is um, signs and symptoms, and kids lie all the time. So <laughs> it's not, like nothing shows up on diagnostic imaging, they're not that sort of, it's a functional injury, not a structural. So you can't do it with that group on Not really, I mean the post-concussive symptom score is kind of our best one right now, but even that can be really not so useful in some ways, because you could say only migraine, like if a child would want to kill himself, he just had migraines, we would have scored that a six, none of the other symptoms, and he would have looked like he had six out of 132 or some kid could have 10 really, really minor symptoms that aren't really bugging him and he looks worse off because he scored 10. So no, we don't have a great way to do that. So much good.